Well, novelty theory is something I've been working on since the early 70s, uh, inspired by psychedelic plant experiences in the Amazon to attempt to look at time and really deconstruct it and attempt to understand what it is. And this has been a wild intellectual ride uh, leading to some pretty easily stated conclusions. Uh, one is that novelty, which is my term for complexity or advanced organization, novelty increases as we approach the present moment. The universe you and I are living in is a far more novel and complicated place than the early universe was. Well, some people would say, well, that's just a consequence of the unfolding of developmental processes. But this asks the question, what are developmental processes? Why should the universe have a preference for order over disorder? Especially when we have something called the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us exactly the opposite. Physicists believe the universe is running down ultimately into a state of disorder. But what I see is everywhere the emergence of more and more complex forms, languages, organisms, technology always building on the previously achieved levels of complexity. So that was one of my insights. Coming out of that insight was the further understanding that this process of complexification through time is not proceeding at a steady rate. It actually follows a kind of asymptotic curve. In other words, it's happening faster and faster. And this was a revelation to me because it allowed me philosophically to contextualize the human world and to understand that human technologies, languages, migrations, art movements, ideologies are not something different from nature. They're the same uh, download of process that we see in the movement of continents, the evolution of new species of animals, except that these human novel emergent situations are happening much more quickly. So I see the cosmos, if you will, as a kind of novelty producing engine, a kind of machine which produces complexity in all realms, physical, chemical, social, whatever, and then uses that achieved level of complexity as the platform for further complexity. Well, this explains our present circumstance. It explains the rush toward all forms of new technology and social organization in the new millennium. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that if the universe is complexifying faster and faster, an um, uh, epoch, a time will come when this rate of complexification is occurring so rapidly that it will become itself the overwhelming phenomena in the world of three-dimensional space and time. And I call this the omega point or the transcendental object at the end of history. And I believe it is not that far off that with the emergence of a global internet, a human population of several billions, an electronic noosphere, uh, that we are now within the shadow of this transcendental object at the end of time. Our religions sense it. That's what gives them their apocalyptic intuitions. And I think the ordinary man and woman in the street sense a kind of built-in acceleration to time itself. I am very perplexed when you say that time is speeding up. As far as I can tell, um, such things as crystal oscillators, things which keep time, um, clocks, uh, the, the relationship of uh, the earth turning to the calendar, the full moon, all of the things which um, are symptoms of our passage through time don't seem to be throwing themselves out of kilter. So how, how, how what can you, can you, do you really mean about time speeding up? 
Well, let me answer in the form of a question. Which lasts longer, a million years in which nothing happens, or 10 seconds with 50,000 events crammed into it? In other words, uh, uh, really time is only experienced by the events which occur within it. And I maintain that the early universe had very little going on and consequently uh, time moved very, very slowly. Uh, the character of time as we approach the present is that there are more and more uh, what physical domains and energetic domains in which change can occur. For example, the early universe was a pure plasma, a pure swarm of unassociated electrons. You didn't even have atomic systems, let alone chemistry, molecular chemistry, life, complex speciated life, and uh, dynamically balanced planetary ecosystems. Each one of those more complex phenomena crystallized out or emerged, if you will, from the previous uh, uh, systems that had come into existence. So when I say time is speeding up, what I mean really is that more and more is happening more and more is happening. And if you ask the question, well, what would be the ultimate state of connectivity or of happening? It's when all points are connected to all other points. Somehow this concept of connectivity is intimately linked to the concept of complexity. And so really what I'm saying is that the universe is getting its act together. It's connecting the dots. It's bringing everything into co-relationship with everything else. And somehow it does this through the production of consciousness. Consciousness is this integrative function in biology which takes data which may appear profoundly unrelated, and in fact brings it into some kind of a congruent relationship. We say an organism coordinates a point of view. Well, in a way, what's happening over time is that the universe is coordinating a point of view. And as it does this, it becomes somehow more aware, more self-conscious, more uh, being-like and less thing-like. And as I said, this process is not proceeding at a steady pace. It's proceeding faster and faster. More connectivity occurs now in a calendar year than occurred in a million years, a billion years ago. So sometime, somehow, as we approach the present, we find ourselves in an ever-denser realm of activity, interrelationship, connectivity, and the result of this is more of the same, producing a shrinking globe, ever more immersive technologies, a dissolution of political, social, gender, and class boundaries of all sorts. So that's what I mean when I say the universe is speeding up. You know, before the advent of, of man, of human beings, the fastest changes on this planet of any consequence were genetic changes, changes in the genomes of plants and animals. Well, biologists know that for a fruit fly to add a spur to its leg, for a bird to change its plumage, you need hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of years of evolutionary time. With the advent of human beings using spoken language, a, a new kind of possibility was born. It's called epigenetic change. In other words, change which is not about genes, but which is about uh, languages, customs, behaviors of human beings. Epigenetic change reaches its uh, dramatic culmination in speech, writing, uh, and communication of all sorts. And so the carriers of epigenetic change, the human beings, are automatically then the carriers of accelerated 
novelty. And so when you look at, let's say, evolution on a coral reef, and you compare it, let's say, to the evolution of political ideas in modern Europe, obviously, modern Europe's rate of change in this domain is thousands of times faster. So by moving from the genetic to the epigenetic realm, we have vastly accelerated all kinds of processes. Now we appear to be about to move from the strictly human domain to the human machine symbiosis domain. And of course, machines process information, make connections and do their work at a rate thousands of times faster than any human being can work. So we see again a progressive acceleration of the process of creating and maintaining varieties of connectivity. And that's what I mean by time is speeding up. Yes, in the Amazon, all was chaos and mythic revelation, but I knew that you couldn't bring that back as a scientific theory, and my bias has always been toward science. And out of these many intuitions and revelations, I discerned a thread which was about time. Uh, it began with a conversation with this Logos entity where it said to me, did you know every day is composed of four other days? And I said, no, I not only didn't know that, it's never occurred to me. What a bizarre idea. Well, so this, I, this idea then of a time being a resonance created by other times, not immediately before or after it, as in scientific causality, but somehow a day centuries ago, centuries in the future, come together to create an interference pattern that creates the unique moment. So that was uh, one of the basic assumptions. And then the structure on which this all was hung was uh, the I Ching which may seem exotic to American and European audiences, but which is, of course, as familiar to anyone in Chinese society as the Declaration of Independence is to us. And what is the I Ching? Well, it's a very ancient uh, method of divining and predicting the future based on the idea that every moment can be symbolized by a, a unique ideogram, which is somehow uh, uh, its essence, much in the way that science believes you can explain all nature with 108 elements, the ancient Chinese took the position that time itself was made of elements. My style of thinking is scientific enough that uh, if I were to say to somebody, I propose a revolution in physics based on what I know about an ancient Chinese divinatory system, that would seem foolish to me. It seems occult. It seems unscientific. Uh, why should an ancient Chinese book of divination hold any insight whatsoever for modern physics? But the uncanny thing about the I Ching is that it seems to work. Even in the hands of its critics, it seems to work. So let me try out a metaphor on you, which I think makes much more clear uh, what's going on here. Visualize for a moment sand dunes. And notice when you look at these sand dunes in your mind that they look like wind. Sand dunes look like wind in some sense. Well, then analyze the situation. What is wind? Wind is a pressure variant phenomena that fluctuates over time. Uh, in a way, the sand grains moved about by the wind are like a lower dimensional slice of the wind itself. And from photographic analysis of dunes, you can calculate the speed and duration of the wind that made them. So the dune is a lower dimensional slice of time, of the wind 
ebbing and flowing that made it. Well, now let's change the metaphor a little bit. Instead of grains of sand, let's think of genes. Instead of a windstorm, let's think of a billion years of evolution. It moves the genes around in a pattern which is a lower dimensional slice of the force which created the situation. In other words, on every living organism, there is the imprint of the higher dimensional force which made it. Now, somebody could say, well, that's God. Well, but in a scientific context, we don't speak like that. But whatever it is that made blind matter into whales, squirrels, and human beings, it left its calling card inside each human being, each squirrel, each whale. That's the DNA. Well, the DNA codons are based on a system of 64, exactly like the I Ching. So my belief is that someone, some group of people thousands of years ago, looked into human organism, looked by meditative techniques into the center of their own beings, and they were not mystics, nor were they empiricists. They were simply curious. But at the center of the meditative experience, they saw an ebb and flow, an energy field that was in a constant state of flux. And they asked themselves, how many elements are necessary to describe this energy field? And the answer was more than 10, less than 1,000 more than 20, less than 500. And when they finally got it worked out, lo and behold, 64 situations are all the possible potential situations there are. Out of 64 subtypes of time, you can create everything from the coronation of Queen Mary to the resignation of Madonna out of 64 types of time. So really, what the I Ching is, is not a book of Chinese mysticism. It's a book of uh, molecular dynamics that sees through biology to the physics that allowed biology to come into existence. And um, I, I'll argue this with anybody in the field, regardless of how hardcore an empiricist they claim themselves to be, because uh, I think uh, the coincidence between the structure of the I Ching and the structure of the DNA is staggering. It's not a simple correspondence between 64 and 64. All the processes that occur in DNA can be easily modeled uh, with the six-line hexagrams that make up uh, the I Ching. It's almost as though Western science was fascinated by energy. For 5,000 years, we pursued understanding energy. And this process ends with thermal nuclear explosions in the deserts of the American Southwest. We can light the fire that burns in the heart of the distant stars. We know how to do that. That's what the Western mind achieved, political issues aside. The Eastern mind was not interested in energy. It was interested in time. And they spent 5,000 years deconstructing it, looking at it. And you don't use atom smashers. You don't use enormous physical pressure. It's a different problem, and you bring different tools to bear. You meditate. You look inside yourself. You study the m movement of water around pebbles. You consider the situation. You study history. In any case, the bottom line is, the people who pursued this understanding of time achieved as sophisticated a relationship to time as the Western relationship to matter expressed through our ability to trigger fusion and fission. 